He ain't had his meds. What happened when he never had his meds last? He killed his wife with a claw hammer. Man, you didn't know whether this geezer was gonna just fucking go and kill us all. Needle hanging out his arm. I kept away from him after that, if I'm honest with you. Colin comes along and fucking beats the shit out of him right in front of me. And if they catch me, they're probably gonna fuck me up or try to do something to me. As the screws came and opened the door in the morning, Wade ran out and done both of them. 2.6. So it's 2.6 tonnes. The feds robbed 400 kilos. Rick, listen to me. Don has offered me 100 grand to kill Tony. You've got to understand this. In my country, for that money, I will cut their head off and eat it. So they're coming walking towards me. I'm shitting myself a little bit, but I'm ready to fight, man. If it's gonna go off, it's gonna go off. As he comes closer to me, he walks by the side, taps me on the shoulder. Says, gracias. I was like, oh my God. So from there, I knew I had a good contact. So that was a relief, man, that had been on my mind for two days. Now the trust, a little bit of trust was there with these geezers. I knew I had a good little link. I could get weed in. I didn't know how long I was gonna be there. Got on the phone to Daisy, everything's cool. Put her mind at rest, man, cause she was going crazy on the other side over this. I've been in there a month now, and I haven't had a visit. I haven't seen anybody, I only spoke to people on the phone. So when you first got in there, it was fucking hard to get a visit, mate. It was hard to get anything when you first got in there, you know? But a month went on, I managed to get a visit. So I had my brother, my dad, and Daisy, that came in to see me, but Jason tried to get in there as well, but they wouldn't let him in. They only let them free in. Jason was my best mate. The whole other story with him, whether he'll let me get into it. If you if you go back and watch my vlogs, you'll see that my old man actually works for Jason now. As far as they told me, it was really hard to get in. It took a lot of time, a lot of waiting, a lot of paperwork. It were not a straightforward thing like English nicks. It was really hard to get into. So anyway, I got my clothes visit. Escorted out the yard by Jeffrey. Remember Jeffrey? All the way to the visiting area, and it's just one long room and it's a closed visit and it's just glass mate all the glasses beat up you're on a tiny little stool like this spit everywhere and you know what I mean it's just horrible mate it's fucking horrible but I got to see all three of them and it was incredible and it's what I needed I just needed to see them you know and a bit of normality back in my life even if it was just an hour, mate, it was like I needed it. So another day goes by, I meet this Romanian lad called George. Now George was from a place in Romania called Constanza. Constanza, I hope I'm saying that right, Constanza. He was in there for credit card fraud. He weren't nothing like them other Romanians, man. Like he was a straight up proper fella. But he had no money, he had fuck all. He had no, no people fighting for him on the outside like we did. You know, we were very, very lucky. You know, due to the circumstances we had people people fighting for us on the outside. There was a lot of people that had no money, no family, nobody fighting from or nothing. So we were blessed in that department. But George, lovely geezer, and we got on like a house on fire, man. At this point, there was just me and Carlos, but there was a spare bottom bunk. At this point, there was a water shortage in the prison. You couldn't have a shower. You couldn't drink out the taps, not that you wanted to. You couldn't flush your toilet or anything. So you're having to shit and you can't even flush it, mate. So there's just one thing shitting in front of each other anyway and smelling each other's shit. Yeah, but then there's another thing you can't even flush it, bruv. Because when you have a shit in, in the prison, you, you shit and then you flush it instantly. So no smell goes out. You know, it's just a courtesy fucking thing. In this, so this time, man, we had no water, no running water, nothing. Can't have a shower. You can't do nothing with no water. We got to fill up one Chibola, one cell, had one bucket of water one, every day to flush your shit down. I felt sorry at this point for no for people who had nothing because like at least I could afford to now buy bottles of water and things like that. You know, I felt sorry for a lot of people who had nothing, but George was one of those people, so, and he weren't like the rest of these other, other motherfuckers. He had a brain on him. He knew what he was doing with the whole, all right, it was into credit card fraud and all that, but he knew what he was doing. He was intelligent enough to be running around Europe, not paying a fucking penny on credit cards. All right, he got caught, but you know, you have to have a certain level of intelligence to be doing that anyway. So we weren't like these other petty thieves and, and that, what are in there. He was a good, genuine, 
fella. So anyway, so he's moved in the cell. There's, so there's me, George and Carlos. Just so during this sort of like no water crisis, they dried up a full 24 hours of having no pills to give nobody. No methadone to give no one. No fucking uh, sleeping pills. No nothing. You know, these and uh, these pills, what Carlos had, he had a whole handful of fucking pills. He never had no pills. So there's me and George in this cell and Carlos has not had his pills the whole fucking day. As soon as Carlos used to come in the cell, cover himself up, have a fucking wank, and go to fucking sleep. You can't say nothing to this fella, but this particular time he's pacing around the cell. You never used to really hear about him. He's pacing around the cell, up and down. Me and George are looking at each other like, what the fuck? Yeah, he ain't had his medication. He ain't had, he ain't had his meds. What happened when he never had his meds last? He killed his wife with a claw hammer. He starts set, so now, Carlos starts settling down a little bit. Now me and George have got to take shifts. He sleeps for a couple of hours, I sleep for a couple of hours, and vice versa, the whole fucking night. That's what we had to do to keep an eye on him. So we're slyly, as we're trying to calm him down, we're walking around the cell, slyly picking up anything that he could fucking stab us with and throwing it out the cell into module one. We overlooked module one. So I'm seeing little razor blades. He used to take apart the razor blades and make shanks and all sorts of fucking shit Carlos did off the head. So these little razor blade things were everywhere around the sink, yeah? So I was just slightly picking them up and do you know what I mean? Just in case, man, you didn't know whether this geezer was gonna just fucking go and kill us all. So you know, you're throwing them out, but you know, if you look out your cell, at night, all you see is lines being thrown. Lines, lines being thrown, yeah? So people used to have, used to rip their bed sheets up, tie them in the knots, you get a long, long line of it. This is how they used to move stuff from the top cells to the bottom cells, up the unit, or even on to a whole nother module. You used to tie whatever you wanted to the top of it, put a weight on the top, then you get your broom, the broom handle, whip it round and flick it. And then the other people got their broom out, holding it out like that and catching it, bringing it in. And that goes on all night long, along with zoo animals. It's like an asylum zoo in there. They're all making crazy zoo asylum noises the whole fucking night long. Absolutely crazy place. So we got through the night with Carlos. Next day comes, he gets his pills, everything goes back to normal. Carlos is sweet again. At this point, I've now got more gear coming in. And I'm sharing with Carlos. George didn't don't smoke or nothing. All George drunk was a can of coke. That was it, he was happy with that. Didn't want to get in debt with anybody or start any of that, very smart. Carlos, at this time, I'm speaking a lot better Spanish at this time. I'm talking fluently with Carlos, everything's sweet. Right, now Carlos knew everybody and I had a lot of weed. There weren't no weed on the module. At this point, I was in the yard smoking freely, so everybody knew I had weed. I was keeping people sweet. Maybe I shouldn't do this, but when we was going up to the cell, I was giving everybody a hit on a bucket and you put like, um, you, you sprinkle your hash on the top, pull the bottle up and it draws the smoke through, take the tin foil cap off the top and hit it like that. Anyway, that's how we was smoking it in there because it was a quick little thing. But when I was on the yard, I was rolling it up. So I was keeping everybody sweet, you know, which was a silly thing to do really, you know, and it was getting a little bit on top too quick. I was bringing everybody back to the cell to give them a hit on this just to keep everybody sweet everybody's unit sweet so I had the Russians Romanians everybody all, all these different cliques I had and different nationalities coming up taking a hit off my little bong so as I say the word was spreading about that I had the bud Carlos knew everybody he was here there everywhere so I thought you know what for I'm talking the tiniest tiniest little micro dot of hash look at your finger now quarter that up yeah the size of that, the tiniest, tiniest little bit of hash could sell for two packs, two, like 40 fags, two decks of fags. Carlos knew everybody and I thought it would be a sensible move to get Carlos to start running it for me. Yeah, to start knocking it out around the yard. Silly idea, I know. But it's what it is, mate. I'm in there playing poker. He's running up, giving me decks of fags, decks of fags, decks of fags. It was getting too on top, mate, too quickly. So as I say, I knew it was a silly move. It just made sense at the time. I had loads of this shit. Everybody wanted it. I weren't trying to be like a like, little drug kingpin of the fucking wing. Weren't trying to do none of that, mate. I just so happened to have it. So happened to have the, the sickest runner, yeah, in my cell who knew everybody, so put two and two together. So another day goes by, so in the yard you still got Nikolai and Narius. Tensions are flaring still, so you just don't know what's gonna happen. I don't know who's gonna make the first move, but there's still tensions over that watch, mate. Next thing you know, they get robbed again. If it weren't bad before, it's fucking bad now, but, but this is what the Rockies were like, man. And as I say, 
I'm not talking about all Rockies. Just these particular people inside this prison, this is what they were like, mate. The, I was very close with a younger Russian, Nikolai. Everybody was warning me to keep away from him and said, like, he's a smackhead, he's a smackhead, Rick. Can't you see he's a smackhead? And I was like, mate, I don't know many smackheads in my life. So I couldn't really see it in the fella. I'm walking around the yard one day and right at the end part of it, as I say, that little hut shelter bit, there he was, Nikolai needle hanging out his arm. I kept away from him after that, if I'm honest with you. I was still trying to keep, get it be around me and I was like trying to keep it sweet, but keeping him at arm's length at this point. It was going off over there. It was going off over there. It was best just to keep my own focus. So, you know, me and George, me and George just chilled throughout the day. He was cool, but at the same time, Cole was jealous as fuck. He was like, from day dot, the moment he saw me, homed in on me. As I said, he had nothing, so so then he took dislike to George. Didn't like George at all. We were talking outside the cell, me and George, before we went in and got locked down, and Colin comes along and fucking beats the shit out of him right in front of me. If you've been in jail, you know that you can't really jump in on situations like that. You know, as a one-on-one -on -one man, what are you gonna do? It's jail. So as I say, so I'm keeping myself to myself, you know, but you still got the Colombian boys on the yard. They still want to fuck me up deep down. If they catch me, they're probably going to fuck me up or try to do something to me. So why he's still there mediating it, you know? So the Brummy boys are there, but now the Brummy boys have just got Fianza, which is bail. And it was emotional. They've been in there for a quite a while. But you got to think, you know, it is short sentences with hash, you know? Like hash is not a big thing. Even in 2006, when I went down for it you know cocaine was a big thing pills any class a's was a big thing but hash was very low down the scale you know you know with the right representation on the outside you know like paying lawyers in the scheme of things hash was not a big thing at all so they lock us down and bearing in mind the world cup is on if you were lucky enough to have a tv in your cell at this point i didn't have a tv in my cell but everybody that everybody else pretty much had so it's going off i think it was like france versus spain right why eat French. In his cell, right at the top, remember he's right at the top, Waid, yeah? He's got Spanish boys that are next to him. Spain, I think, won, so they're giving him mouth through the cell. They're shouting backwards and forwards, you know what I mean? Backwards and forwards. As soon as the screws came and opened the door in the morning, Waid ran out and done both of them. So, for that, he got an extra two years on his sentence, and it weren't long before he was getting out anyway, so, you know, that's what he was like in there. It was weird, you know, it was because they were Spanish that he beat up. You know, as I said, they look after their own in there. So then Waid is given another two years and he's thrown in solitary confinement. At this point, Carlos has made me a, a big, you know, like sports hold all full of cigarettes, mate. Phone cards, cigarettes, that's what he's made me in, in like a week. So out of the blue, one day, Carlos gone. You know, he left with a couple of packs of fags, a couple of phone cards, whatever. You know, I still have my big bag. He left with whatever he had with him on that day. He might have just been pulled straight out. I, I, I don't know, but anyway. So now it's just me and George in the cell. Cell door opens, Waid comes walking in. So now I've got Waid in my cell. Waid comes in and basically takes over. Takes over in a way that you ain't gonna say nothing about it. So he was a Muslim man, so the Muslims are proper clean and that, you know, absolute clean freaks. He laid the rules down as soon as he came in. He said, I want it cleaned every single day. Everything's gotta be spick and span. Listen, he came in, throwing his weight around a little bit in a respectable way, but I didn't give a fuck. I like the fella. I looked at it as like, mate, we can run shit. Now he's in here. So when they got out, the brummies, when they got out, Ben gave me all his shit, yeah? He gave me his CD player. He gave me his hip pop CDs and he gave me his fucking phone, mobile phone. Never even knew he had it. Give me it before he went, Rick, they are, take that. The CD player came apart, four little nuts, took it apart, inside it fitted perfectly the phone and the charger, put the case back on top of it with the phone and the charger in it, screw it back down, turn it on and play music. Fed's never picked it up. So anyway, he's left me this. So now I'm just constantly on the phone, making moves, whatever. But not in no gangster way. I'm not making no gangster moves, man. This is the last time I ever commit any crime in this fucking place after I get out of here. I'm telling you, changed me. Some people ain't gonna change. I ain't up here trying to glorify any of this fucking shit, mate. Like, this is a terrible fucking place for anybody who goes to uh, a banged up abroad, man. You know what I'm saying? It's like, it's easy to get yourself into these 
situations it ain't easy to get get yourself out of them you know like you could go and lump some geezer in, in Marbella you know uh, you know just getting a, a stupid little fight with your mates man go and lump the geezer and then you're in a place like that it may not be like that in 2022 but in 2006 it was like that and 10 times worse I was probably in the, the easy module one day something strange happened some fella come onto the module and he was an American bloke and he had an American accent he did not fit the script whatsoever and at this point you've got to understand you know we were wrapped up in a conspiracy they were trying to place me as one of the main you know heads of this operation and I weren't man I was I was 22 of course I weren't I was I was some kid but on the phone taps was a fella called Rick you know it was just a matter of it it was a matter of proving that I weren't that fella but that was what was keeping me in there so the American geezer could can't remember his name but it was just odd everybody was telling me keep away from him Rick keep away from him but I was the one he was homing in on it's like I was the one that they thought that they could get the information out of or break down or start getting close to and they could infiltrate some shit and his story never added up either everybody was questioning him on it uh, on his story you know he was in there for credit card fraud apparently and he got caught in the store it was just bullshit it was a bullshit story everybody caught on to it straight away and you know he was a nice bloke you know he knew exactly Exactly what to try and say to me to try and make out that he weren't fed but he was fucking fed all day long man as soon as everybody started cottoning on to him that's when he disappeared gone so then I knew I was like oh my god that this is how deep this shit is they're sending people they're sending fucking undercover in to the module to try and get to me it was getting deep in there mate so now you got Don getting more pissed off by the day Lawyer won't talk to him. Lawyer's been paid for 60 grand, 20 grand each, remember? But the lawyer won't talk to him, even though he's representing him. So that made him even more fucking mental. It drove him even more crazy. Poisoned Tony's name even further and, and, uh, and nastier around the, the prison now. So anywhere Tony went, you know, he weren't safe. And, and now Don has got money. So now he's paying these rockies. Now he's literally, now he's really getting them in his pocket, you know, because he's given them a lot. He's given them all their food. I remember I gave him a pair of trainers. He needed a pair of trainers. I've given to him. He gave them straight to the rockies, and I was pissed off about that. But that was his thing, you know. That was his way of building his army, mate. So the lawyer was coming back, and he was telling me, Rick, look to a year in here, you know. So I was like, okay. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at a year. Been in there a couple of months by now, you know, but so I'm reading over the paperwork and I got caught with three tons of hash. But you got to understand, I didn't just get caught red-handed. I had a whole business. This, the whole company was set up specifically for doing this. So I had company logo, I had a company hat, I had a company paperwork. Uh, everything was all legit, mate. So, you know, you're not gonna get in a lorry full of fucking drugs without some sort of backup story. You're fucking mental if you hadn't. So, of course, we had a story for this if it all came on top. We all knew what to say. We all, we, you know, we weren't prepared for this, but we were prepared for to what to say, you know, if it ever did come on top. Of course, mate. What, are you just going to jump in a fucking lorry? You're fucking naked. And don't, don't give a fuck. Fuck that fucking suicide, mate. I got, as I say, I got caught red-handed. I got caught with the three ton, but... The paperwork is now coming back at 2.6. So the feds, the feds robbed 400 kilos. So look, so everybody knows that my real name is Richard Paul Hewitt. My dad's name is Paul Hewitt. THC levels between five and 7% and 2.6. So it's 2.6 tons. Yeah, and there's no fucking way I'm glorifying any of this or think it's funny or anything like that. It was a fucking tragic, terrible, stupid, immature thing to fucking do. It ain't clever. You ain't no fucking gangster. You ain't no bad man because you do things like that. I think you can tell by the way I tell this story and the way that the passion in it all that it is fucking for real. It happened. It ruined my life to this fucking day. So think about that before you're abroad and go do some madness. Because as I say, man, there was, there was one thing what was in there, yeah, and that was wasted talent. One day they had this show. It was a show. You had the opportunity to go and see this fucking show. For why not? What else am I doing? 
So we all went out the module, guided out to this big hall part of the prison. We went in there, and there's this like talent show going on. Okay, so there was guitarists in there, there were singers in there. I've got to say, the wasted talent, the people that are doing, serving a lot of time, and there's so much wasted talent in these places. And it was just, just a shame. Man, it was quite inspiring, you know, because, you know, like I was an inspiring rapper, man. I love to rap and I love to make music. And at this point, you know, I had my mobile phone, so I was constantly ringing Daisy, play my song. Literally, I wrote a few days before I went to prison, Fight to the Top is called. I play a little clip. I ain't gonna play it all, I play it a little bit, you know. Um, me and Daisy wrote that song, it was one of the songs that this record label were interested in. So I was always getting Daisy to play the song, play the song, and it used to just bring me up. Just used to bring my vibration levels back up, make me happy, and make me just, yeah, want to get through this and that, you know? The picture to me now is getting clearer. Hocking in the game, calling out my name, but the fame's getting nearer. I fear the worst, can I revert perfections in the mirror? I ain't a killer, but the demon staring back at me is looking realer. Put the energy I need to deliver for man with the dream. Trying to touch souls to make us one ship, I know it's me. Know my poetry, bring the last stream. My deeds are cards I've been dealt. Have I always been deemed the chops to make some make of myself? Will I succeed? Take on the whole industry itself. Just watch me. I've come to struggle just to get to where I wanna be. All the pieces to the puzzle never fitted. But now I'm blowing up to be a star. Find that who my real friends are. From the ones who forgot I even existed. This is just the beginning, yeah. Sit back and watch him expand. One man stands with only winning with dinner. You know, some prisons are like 23 hour bang up, and but Funkelen weren't really like that, man. You had a lot of time on the yard. Some people would have preferred being banged up. At the start, I'd have preferred being banged up and that, but in the end of it, you want to be out of the cell, you know? It's just nice weather out there and things. At this point, the summer has kicked in, so now they've left you. So the only time you can have a little bit of time to yourself is to fake an illness. So I went to the functionario, they sent me to the medical, and I said, listen, I'm ill. I feel like I'm going to be sick, and they bang you up in your cell for like 24 hours. So in this 24 hours, I my stereo it was a few hip-hop tracks and they never had no instrumentals so i used to use the end of this track where i had like a, a eight bar open verse bit and i used to write my bars to that yeah man a lot i wrote a lot of music in my prison cell a lot of the old music a lot of my music on the spotify that's all old stuff you know i need i've got a lot of new stuff coming but that was all old stuff that was written back in prison and after. So, another day done, back up in the cell. Why is a little bit late coming in? He comes into my cell and he said, Rick, escucha me. Rick, listen to me. Don has offered me a hundred grand to kill Tony. Now, if someone was gonna be able to get that done, it was Waid. <laughs> you know, the fact that he'd come to me, told me exactly how we was gonna do it. Me and Tony had our disagreements, as you know, but I couldn't let him do it. But Rick, you got to understand this. In my country, for that money, I will cut their head off and eat it. 